All right. So yes, my name is Rob. Thank you, Ducky. Um, and there's a few places to talk at me, and you should talk at me because I like to talk and I like to hear what you're working on. And if you think I can help you, you should do that because this isn't one of those, oh, you should definitely write to me and I don't actually really care. That's just not to say. I actually really do, so do. Um, there's a URL there which, has, which will have slides. Um, right now it has a bunch of links because this is a very broad talk. Um, doesn't go deep in a lot of stuff. But if you want to know more about this stuff, like I could talk for days on this topic. So there's some more stuff to help you out. And why you might want that will become clear as we go on. So in terms of my background, um, I'm kind of an old man now. I've got my gray hairs. I'm very proud. But I did comp sci once um, back in 98, 99. I studied computer science at Monash Uni. And uh, then I got a job there. They were rolling out a new mail system. And needed, you know, they hired an army of casuals to go to every desk in the university and install Netscape Communicator as it was in those days. So, um, and then after that, they offered me a job, and I took it because I was like, well, I can finish my degree and get a job, or I can get a job. Um, you probably shouldn't listen to me for career advice. Um, so that job kind of lasted a while. Um, I ended up leading a team there. Um, we went through three mail systems. Um, I have been a sysadmin for Lotus Notes before. I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> you will need to ply me with alcohol for more of those stories. Um, and then in 2012, I decided I had enough and I went out to the private sector. I went to work for Fastmail doing e pretty much exactly the same job, um, mail operations and administration, um, except now my customers pay me and I don't have to deal with the bureaucracy, so it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, I work in operations. It's about keeping lights on, um, making things nice. Um, keeping my users happy. On any given day, I'll do anything from building servers to messing with the database, staring at graphs, installing operating systems, writing tools, filling with style sheets, yelling at customers, yelling at support because they're not talking to customers properly, all sorts of stuff. It's fun. It's brilliant. Um, I like being a jack of all trades, again, based on what we saw last night. Not good career advice. Um, and, uh, I hate this slide. <laughs> so, and all of these things have some security aspect. An email system, security is important. Email users really don't like it when you make their email public. And so I have to think about these things at every step of the way. Um, because then you end up in the news and they use stupid pictures like this. And, and you're like, this is going to be a shitty article. Um, so everything in this talk, I, did, I never finished my degree. Um, and I've done plenty of you know, on-the-job training and stuff. But all of this is stuff I've learned on the job over what I'm up to now, 16 years of my career. Um, happily enough, but the hard way, we've never had a major security problem at Fastmail or at Monash, when I think about it. So maybe that's lucky. Maybe, maybe my time is up. Um, and I'm telling you this because at some point you will deal with a service, a system, an app, um, whether it's something you're building yourself in a startup or in a whatever, or just something you're working on somewhere, you will deal with something that has to deal with controlling access to resources in some way. And you, you need to think about, you know, how does that work and what happens when it goes wrong? But, but that said, I'm not a security expert. I don't have a handful of dollars. Um, but that's okay because maybe there's a couple of you that are thinking about a career in InfoSec, but the rest of us aren't going to be doing that. You're going to be building a thing, and it has security things in it, but it's not that. So it's okay to not be a security expert, but still do security things. Um, and it just means that you need to go and do your own research and understand how things that work and will do stuff and not listen to me or anyone else, uh, you know, too much. Make sure we're not spinning you a bunch of lies. But and that's good because then you'll know how things work. You'll know how your service works. You'll know how your data operates. You'll know what your users are doing. You know, you'll know how things work and you, you need to for a thing that you're doing. And so to that end, we're going to talk about passwords because in terms of security, they are going to be the weakest part of your, the security profile of the thing you're working on because they're pretty much out of your control. Your users bring passwords to the table, um, so you're outsourcing the major part of your security. So they're your weakest point, and thus they become your most important point. So yeah, we're going to have a talk about those. And they're terrible. And you all know this because you've all heard stories and you all have you know, a, a, a parent or a, you know, a grandparent or a, a, a friend who, you know, their, their password is the name of their cat or the name of their kids or this sort of thing. And you, you know, are sad whenever they talk about it. The thing I've discovered is it's always been terrible. 
right since the beginning. So let's go and look at the beginning. Or at least the beginning of when passwords as we know it were used with computers. So 1961, and the backstory here is, um, in this case, IBM are building computers. And they're big computers. I think in this particular case, um, it was about a $30 million computer adjusted to 2016 money. So these things are expensive and, and rubbish by any standards. And because no one could afford them, they would give them away to, or vastly discount them for universities and stuff to try and get people using them, that sort of thing. So, but the trade-off for that was that IBM would get top priority if they wanted to use the machine. They could ring up it because they can't afford too many of them either. So they would ring up and say, right, you need to run our, our job, whatever task, you know, whatever box of punch cards we've got ready to go. And whatever was running on the machine would basically just get discarded, its work was lost, you know, they get their job run and then you pick up where the other one left off. And that sucked. So at MIT, they started working on what they called the compatible time sharing system. Compatible because it could run all the programs that had already been written. And it's time sharing, this is just multitasking. There's a job running, um, a high priority job comes along, you put that one aside, you run that one when it finishes, you bring it back and it picks up where it, lifts off, where it left off. And so that's fine. And then passwords are then used to allocate resources. So, and, and so every user in the system was sort of granted you know, some amount of runtime that they were allowed to use. So IBM gets top priority, they can do whatever they want. You know, professor might get lots of time, grad student, or I don't know if undergrad students got to use these things, but you know, not much time at all. So that's fine, that's all very sensible. That's a reasonable use of passwords and that's what we understand from today. So the next year, there's a PhD student named Alan Sher and he's been given four hours a week to run his simulations and he wanted or needed more. And so it turns out the print service on this machine runs as a privileged user and it can read any file in the system, it runs as root. And so he writes a program to ask the print service to print the password file. And it does. <laughs> and so, and now he can log into lots of people's different accounts and run bits of his simulations in those and get lots of work done. Um, and it gives everyone a copy to cover his tracks. <laughs> so lo lots of people have been doing this. Um, yeah, and, and the, the, I don't know if it's true, but the story goes that uh, like 25 years later, he was at like a dinner function with his professor at the time, and he sort of fessed up, you know, sheepishly. At, that point. at this point, he's had like, like an illustrious career with IBM and doing all sorts of stuff. And he sort of says, yeah, I did that. And they're like, yeah, we know. And we kind of just decided to let it slide and give you your PhD anyway. So that was nice. Um, so we're a year in, we're doing all right. And then four years later, we saw the first unintentional leak of the password database, and this is cool. So at this point, the computer's been upgraded and it has teletypes. So these are your, you know, like, like your terminal, except they were a, a line printer. So you had a keyboard and a printer and it would print things a line at a time. And so it's a multi-user environment. Um, so you had one user editing the password file, and you had another user editing the message of the day file, which is, the text that's printed out when you log in. Um, usually to tell you messages from the sysadmin or whatever's going on. And so these edit this editor worked much, this, this part of it worked much the same as an editor does now. When it needs to actually save the file, it writes down to a temporary file and then moves that into place. This particular editor used the same temporary file for all editor sessions. And so it raced, it, you know, wrote, the password, the password file was saved and the message of the day file was saved in such an order that the password file was written to the message of the day file and was then um, displayed to everyone when they logged in. Um, and the other bit of the story of this is the emergency fix for this was to crash the machine um, using like some instruction that was basically never, in, uh, some you know, CPU instruction that was basically had no purpose at all other than to screw up and crash the machine. And it was done at 5 p.m. on a Friday. So, Friday afternoons have a long and story history. I love it. So, so this is okay. You know, we're five years in and basically everything that can go wrong with passwords and has ever gone wrong with passwords has already happened. But lessons were learned. Um, so that message of the daily made it very clear that some sort of non plain text storage was necessary. And so they started doing experiments and eventually came back onto one-way hash, uh, one hash functions, I should say. And the idea with these is, um, rather than storing the literal password, 
you run the password through a function that derives a value from the password and you store that instead. And then when the login occurs, you take the user's password, you create that derived value and you compare those. So you can tell if the user presented the correct password without ever knowing what the password is. So this is all right. And this was first widely implemented in Unix 6 edition, which was uh, released in 1974. And I wanted to know what, more about what that looked like. So I looked around for a while. Now, these were distributed on the big, you know, the big real tapes. And um, I managed to find a copy of like, the tape archive, so just a, you know, a file. Nothing on my system could do anything with it. And it was late at night at that point. I couldn't be bothered trying to rip the password file out of it. So I went looking for an emulator. So I found a PDP-11 emulator, which is a computer I ran on at the time, written in JavaScript that runs in the browser, which is awesome. Um, and this is my, my session with, with Unix 6 edition. I cat the password file, and you know it has four users. So Ken, Ken Thompson, is you know a user on every Unix 6 edition system. And then I give him a password, and then this AO42 business, we see the the um, hash password written out. So I'm like, that's cool. I don't really have a story there. I just thought it was cool. So, so this is good. So in 1979, this paper was released, um, Password Security, A Case History. And this is by Robert Morris, who um, was the implementer of Crypt in Unix 6 edition, and uh, Ken Thompson, who kind of wrote you know, the rest of Unix. Slight exaggeration, but you know. They did a review of like the password system and the Unix security model and everything they'd kind of learned up until that point and everything they failed with up to that point. Now this is brilliant paper. It's only four pages long. It's linked from the link I showed before. If you only read one other thing from this talk, this should be it um, because everything in it is relevant to today, um, which is cool and stunningly terrifying. One of, so one of the things they included in there was an analysis of the passwords that were currently in use at the time. And so this is a little screen cap from, because it used to be on real paper, I don't, yeah, no, it's readable. But I'll give you a sec to sort of have a look at that. So yeah, the, the summary there is, they reviewed about 3,300 passwords about 2,800 of them, so around 85% were garbage. They were simple alphanumerics of six characters or less, or dictionary words, or both. No, yeah, we're not quite 20 years in, and people using crappy passwords is the norm, which is you know, inspiring. But you know, that was 40 years ago, and I'm sure everything's changed, right? You know, we've now got you know computers in our pockets. We're all on the internet all the time. Of course, it's changed. I, I chose to use. I figured, yeah, 2015. I can still just get away with BuzzFeed-style titles, right? So, it's a company called Splash Data, and they make a password manager product. And every year, they publish a list of the worst passwords they've seen for the year. So the 2015 list was released in February this year, and they'd analyzed um, over 2 million passwords that they'd obtained from leaks and breaches and, and this kind of thing. And it's about as terrible as you'd expect. This is the top 10. So, that was kind of inspiring, yeah. Left to their own devices, people are going to choose crappy passwords, okay? And this has been going on for almost 60 years. It's probably fair to say at this point, it's not going to change. So that's the inspiring part of this talk. And there are things we, but there are things we can do to help. We can, there are things we can do. But before we do that, we should look at why do we care? Why are bad passwords a problem? And it seems obvious, but yeah, let's have a look. All right, so as far as I can tell, you are all people. Um, I'm not seeing anything particularly unusual from here. If you're a person, having a bad password is bad for you. Your bad password is easy to guess. Um, if I know some facts about you, 
then I am able to reduce the number of possible passwords that I can try. You know, I, and, and things about you are easy to find. Um, you put your name and your location and your hobbies and your dreams on Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, I, you know, these facts are, you would probably tell me if I asked you. Um, you. Other people would definitely tell me if I, you know, call a government department or I call, you know, a fan club or I call an emergency hotline or something and I pretend to be someone, you know, I can definitely find out facts about you that way. There's a little bit of info on your conference badge. Individually, none of these things are a problem, but add them up and I can start to get a sense of what things you might like. You know, you talk a lot about being a member of a football club. Maybe the name of the football club or something derived from it is your password. Yeah, it's, all, it's there if I want it badly enough. But even if I can't guess it, I can start making guesses just using dictionary words because you have a bad password. If your password is based on any word, there's a good chance that I can find it. Um, and that's even more a problem if I can actually run these tests on my local machine, which I can do if I manage to get hold of a password database from some service, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. And your bad password is likely to be reused, which doesn't obviously follow, but why do people make bad passwords? Does anyone have an idea? So they can remember them. If you don't have a good system for remembering your password, then you are more likely to use your crappy password on a bunch of different services um, because you have trouble remember remembering things. And that means if I discover one password, I now have access to a whole bunch of stuff. And God help you if I get access to your email password because that's where all the password recovery emails go. So now I can get access to anything. I can just speculatively put your email address into a whole bunch of different services and see what falls out. As a rule, the best password is the one you can't remember, which means you have to use a password manager. So if you are not, go and do that. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> but if you're running a service, then your users having bad passwords is bad for your service. You have a duty of care to your users. They, you provide them a service and they expect you to do a good job and they expect you to protect their interests. And that's hard to do if they keep getting their account hacked. And your service needs to be trustworthy to the outside world because every service you might build these days is going to have some sort of sharing or collaborative component to it. Okay? And for that to work, you have to be trustworthy. It has, you have to have a good reputation. I have to believe that when I receive something from someone or something is shared with me, that it really came from them. And if your users have bad passwords, if and then their accounts keep getting hacked, I don't have that guarantee anymore. And worst case, you start becoming known as a dodgy service. You know, spammers turn up, all sorts of you know, phishing and scams and whatever else turns up. You start to lose customers. You don't get new customers and you, your reputation dies. And as we know, once you lose your good reputation, it is incredibly difficult to get back. And your service is at the mercy of other services because you can do everything right. You can get your security spot on. You can have every technology implemented correctly, perfectly. And if your user has a bad password and that other's crappy service, if their account gets done on there, then there's a hook into your system now and you're at risk. And if you're a pet, your human having a bad password is bad for you too. And that's why. Cheap laughs, right? Just, there's no one that, if, other way around, everyone loses while bad passwords exist. So we have a goal in mind, that's good. But we can do things to help. So this talk is about three things we can do to improve the situation. There are ways that we can encourage and help our users to produce good passwords. And then we can make sure that those passwords are hard to use in the event that the password database is ever leaked, ever gets out. And then we can actually make it so that knowing a password is useless, isn't enough. Let's have a look at these. So we want, to, we want to encourage our users to create high quality passwords. And we know how to do this. How do we, how do, we do this? That would work, doesn't scale. <laughs> it is a dream. 
The answer is password policy. Password policy? No, this? Come on. So well, let's make a password policy, like right now. So our passwords for our service, they have to be at least eight characters long, they have to have an uppercase letter, they have to have a lowercase letter, they have to have a number, and they have to have a symbol. All right, you've seen this, yeah? Yeah. And it must work because everyone does it. And that's, that's how you know. No, not really. Given that password policy, that is a great password. That's shit password. That is a crap password, but only because you won't know it. <laughs> but that structure of password, the way it was generated, is actually, like, that's a really good password. So this is the wrong way to think about passwords, and we have to burn it all down. And, ooh, I stole your thunder, but there you go. There's, you watch the talk later, it's great. What we are actually really interested in, we want to talk about the strength of a password. And the strength of a password isn't about its length, and it's not about the amount of weird stuff in it. Okay, this, it's not entirely true. It is about those things, but it's about more than those things. What we're re how did that turn out? Oh, it's not too bad. You never know what things are going to look like once they're up there. But we're really interested in the amount of randomness. Um, so a recap of randomness. We, uh, if we flip a coin a hundred times, which I won't do because the sounds in here are terrible <laughs> for that. Um, if we flip a coin a hundred times, if it's a perfectly random coin, we should get 50 heads and 50 tails. Or if we flip it you know, a million times, we should get half a million heads and half a million tails. Because anything wildly different um, would you, you know, allow it to be guessable a lot of the time. Or another way of putting it, if you choose a random number between 1 and 100, and I'm trying to guess it, it should take me on average 50 guesses to guess it. Because on average, you know, search space in half. But if your choice isn't random, then it becomes much easier for me to guess, like I was saying. You know, especially if four is popular this month. If everyone's choosing four, well, I'm going to try four. You know, and it's the same for passwords. If your password isn't random, it's easier for me to guess. You know, if Pokemon Go is still a thing, and it is a thing, when I wrote this, I wasn't sure if it was still a thing, because you know, I'm old now. Um, you know, maybe your password is the name of your favorite Pokemon. So, you know, I'm going to try that first. Um, so making a password longer, or adding in more characters, that increases the number of possible passwords, same way that 1 to 1,000 has more possibilities than 1 to 100. But you know, 4 is still 4, and Snorlax is still Snorlax. And don't talk to me about Pokemon, because I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it had good transparency. <laughs> so what we want to do, instead of relying on the user to follow a set of rules, we want to actually test the password they give us and then give them some feedback, tell them how they're doing, tell them how strong it is. And because we're now actively testing their password, we can consider you know, common words and phrases and structures and, and you know, sequences on the keyboard and whatever else we like, depending on you know, what our service is about. You know, if we're a forum for, if we're, we're a football forum, I don't know why I'm going with football, I don't care about football, I think it's just I saw it before, but if, yeah, if we're a football forum, then we can say, you know, you, your password is football, that's crap. You know, or it's based on uh, something like that. The point is you can test against your, 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 the domain that your service operates in. Um, and then you can adjust the score of that appropriately. You can tell users, well, you know, this isn't very strong, or this is awesome, or whatever. Um, and there's actually research to suggest that this helps users produce better passwords. They look at the score, and they want a higher score. You know, so yeah, gamification of passwords. Um, you know, we can make money out of that, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> if you're looking for a place to start with this, um, you want a tool called ZXCVBN, which does not have any other silly pronunciation, um, which is, it would have been cool if it did. Um, by Dropbox, they, they have carefully considered a whole bunch of things. Uh, there's a bunch of different password checkers out there, but this one is quite smart about taking the user's taking the user's context into account, like what language they're in and these kind of things. Um, and this is actually the one we use at Fastword, Fastmail now. We don't have any other password policy in place. You have to score at least one point for us to take your password. If you get a zero, which you do on basically any simple password, we won't accept it. Anything more than that, all good. We'd like to do more, but we have a lot of um, non-technical users, so you know, work on it. All right, high five. We're doing well. All our users now have great passwords, guaranteed. 
but we still have to keep them secret. So let's talk a bit about data breaches and leaks. And here we're talking about password databases being you know, removed from a server, exfiltrated is the word. You know, uh, yeah, a password database being dumped or leaked or hacked or however you want to term it. So this is a great site called Have I Been Owned? And I'm going to say owned because the pronunciation isn't clear, but translate in your head if you need to. Uh, it's by a guy called Troy Hunt. And what he does, he gets hold of, he's got a you know, fairly extensive set of contacts, and he gets hold of password breaches by whatever means, and he does a bunch of analysis work on them, and loads them into a database, um, you know, removes sort of personally identifiable information. But then you can search on them and, and sort of, you know, run particular kind of analysis against them, find out you know, what people are using, which services are, are having problems, and all this sort of thing. And you can actually register your email address on this, and I encourage you to do so. Um, and if, excuse me, if your email address ever shows up in uh, a password database leak, um, you'll receive an email, and it will tell you, you know, this service had a leak on this date, and you know, maybe you should do something about that. And so on the front page of this site, it shows the top 10 breaches in the database by the number of records. So there's, you know, there's some big names in there that you might sort of expect to know what they're doing. Um, and the Twitter feed is really cool. Um, I don't know how visible that is. Oh, that's good. That always works. So this is just a very small sample from the last couple of months. Um, at the point, and there's probably a new post like every couple of days. Um, there are small sites everywhere that are routinely having their password databases um, you know, taken out from under them. Uh, Minecraft sites are a big one at the moment. Minecraft forums and Minecraft modding sites and this sort of thing. There seems to be a lot of those at the moment. So, yeah. And so Troy asks this question. He says, how can we help people impacted by data breaches without making life worse for them? And that's what this is about. Because all this cool technology isn't actually the point. The point is our users trust us to keep their data safe. And I hope, I desperately hope, that your user and password database will never be hacked, will never be stolen. And I'm incredibly thankful to anyone that it hasn't, mine hasn't. But this happens to companies of all sizes and all reputations. So you should assume it's going to happen, and you should put measures in place to deal with it, to be as prepared as you can. And so how can we make passwords, you know, uh, keep them safe against an attacker, make them as useless as possible. So this might be your opponent. This is a person from the internet, and it's useful to have a boogeyman to think about. I love it. And so they've got a hold of a data dump from your service. They have your stored passwords, which should be hashed. If they're plain text, then this entire discussion is pointless. And they'll have usernames or email addresses to go with it. And they might have a bunch of other stuff, you know, credit card numbers, addresses, you know, other personal information. They might even have access to the account. Um, it's, it's, it depends on what the service is. Most, for the purposes of this discussion, most of that stuff is irrelevant, um, other than to say, this is personal information. This helps me narrow down what your password might be. And out of all of this, they want the plain text password. And that's it. Um, the rest doesn't matter, like, like I said. Oh, yeah, unless they're doing, yeah, they're, they're stealing credit card details or they're setting up for some identity fraud, but, and we could talk for hours about that, but that's not what this talk is about. And they have two main constraints along the way. They have a time constraint. They, after a breach is discovered, the service provider is going to start changing passwords. They're going to start locking out accounts. Hopefully, they're notifying their users, and users are going to start changing their passwords and going to other sites and, and you know, doing this. So over time, the passwords in that database are rapidly getting stale. You only have a certain amount of time where it's worth the effort to try and get real password material out of it. And sort of in the, in the time it's money kind of sense, um, this is the same thing. They have a limitation on the amount of money they can spend or more the amount of compute time they can buy on AWS. Um, you know, once it was physical servers, now it's just cloud stuff. But eventually the money runs out. AWS is kind of cheap enough these days that the money doesn't really run out. 
But our goal is to try and push this, up, this cost up as high as we can. And so the answer is actually something we touched on just before, hash functions. I had a good breakfast, so this is not, I'm not drooling over this slide quite as much as I was yesterday before dinner. Um, and we talked about hash functions earlier. Instead of storing, storing the play text password, store a value derived from the password. And since every password has to go through that hash function, we can make sure that we can use the properties of that hash function to slow our attacker down. And so, choosing a hash function. There's a lot of options available. Now, this is like the most texty slide that I have, and I'm not even going to touch it. You, you want a thing called a cryptographic hash function. There are lots of different kinds of hash functions. You want cryptographic hash functions. These are the academic words for the properties that a, a cryptographic hash function has, but basically it's there should only be one input for every output, and if all you have is an output, you shouldn't be able to get to the input. And they're the fields of study around that, and I don't know much about them, a little bit. But under that, you want a kind of hash function called a key derivation function, which takes a low randomness input and produces a high randomness output, because that's what we have. We have low randomness inputs. We have passwords. Um, and the good thing about many of these kind of functions is they're slow, which sounds counterintuitive, because we don't want slow. We want high performance. But we want slow, because we want to slow our attacker down. They're hashing passwords. They're guessing, they're guessing, they're guessing. We need to make that take a long time. I don't have time for a lot of detail, but um, so I, I went for a different kind of lies. I went for benchmarks instead. So um, I ran some numbers. Uh, it's pretty low quality, single threaded, Perl 524 running the test, uh, hashes implemented in C on this 2013 MacBook. And these are the bad, hash word, uh, bad hashing functions. <laughs> They're perfectly good cryptographic hash functions. Um, except maybe MD5. But you know, you've seen SHA-1, if you've used Git, you've seen SHA-1 hashes, and they're fine. They are fine from looking at an input text and saying, are these things the same? But they're too fast. They're too fast for passwords. Um, you know, a SHA, you know if, if, you're, if you're storing SHA-1 hashes, I can generate half a million of them a second on this piece of crap. You know, if I'm parallelizing this over thousands of AWS instances, I can burn through that password file. What you want is these, um, and I'm glossing over so much detail, I'm saying that because I know you know. <laughs> um, but these hash functions generate, you know, are quite slow. Now, we don't want too slow. It would be great if we had a function that took five minutes to generate a hash, but you need to generate hashes yourself when your user logs in. So you want something that is acceptable to a human once, but really becomes a pain in the ass once you do it a lot. So they're good ones. There's detail. There's a lot of detail. And that's this slide. I had a whole bunch of slides describing a whole bunch of detail about this. And they were really long, and they were really boring, and you would have had to go and Google it all anyway. So just go and Google it all anyway. Um, there's a lot more stuff that you need to consider when choosing a hash function. Um, you know, you need to talk about salts and rainbow tables and um, actually read the list, you know, pr what parameters you need for modern hardware and how newer hardware, and you know, like GPUs, can be used to attack older hash functions in interesting ways, and you know, tons of different stuff. Um, and we've only talked about speed in this talk. Um, but you can search for password hashing functions. There's a couple of links from the, the talk website. Um, or otherwise, just find out what the recommended one for your language for this year, because it will change as hardware changes, and just use that, and it's probably fine. So. So while I was writing this talk, I received an email. It was funny timing. From Have I Been Owned? What's this one? And this was the bottom one on that top 10 that's on their website at the moment. It pushed out Ashley Madison, if you remember that from the news in the last year. Um, so Last FM is a kind of social network for music. Your music player writes to it and it shares with your friends what you're listening to right now. And I haven't used it for years. Like I'd completely forgotten that I had an account on it. Um, and apparently, so they were hacked in 2012. The password database was was a copy of what was taken. It was you know, passed around various black market sites because these things sell. Um, and it's only just sort of surfacing right now. So fun facts: 38 million password stored as unsalted MD5 hashes, which is like you know about that far above 
just plain text. Um, some analysis I saw claims to have broken 96% of them in uh, just under two hours so on modern hardware. So MD5, no. I mean, this is horrible, and someone just stopped being with a stick here. Yeah. 250,000 of the, of the passwords were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, another 90,000 were password. So, yeah. So I thought, okay, well, I'll do the right thing. I'll change my password. So this was my password. It was stored in my password manager, which is how I know it. And my password manager also told me I hadn't used this password anywhere else, which makes sense because it generated it as one-off. Um, so this isn't particularly relevant to me. But I thought, yeah, I'll do the right thing. I'll change the password. So I got my password manager to come up with a new one. Um, now, slightly different structure. This is the structure we use for one of Fastmail's security features. Um, so I had my password manager set up to match that because I was doing some tests and stuff. But you know, it's a strong password by pretty any much by pretty much any measure. Um, obviously, this one is not a strong password because again, it's in public now. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. So, you know, I tweaked my password manager to match this format, and now I can go back to not using this account anymore. Um, and, yeah, and that's fine. That's fine for me. But how many people, because of that, ended up having a really bad day? How, ended up having a whole bunch of their accounts stolen because the wrong hash function was chosen? So just don't make your users have a bad day. They're trusting you. Okay. So... What if we could make it so that even if you did manage to get hold of a password, it was useless? What if it could only be used by the owner? It turns out we can sort of do that. And we do that with two-factor authentication. Um, so this is Bono with his two factors. Um, it's not relevant. It's a picture that I used from an earlier talk I did about two-factor, and I still liked it, so I put it in, but whatever. The idea with two-factor auth is that you have to present two different things when you log in. So you have to present something that you know, which is your password, and you have to present something that you have. And no one has, has anything quite that cool. But yeah, some physical item that only you have access to that has previously been registered with the account. Um, it might be an app on your phone. It might be a standalone security device. Uh, these are the, the abbreviations for the common consumer grade ones. There are other ones, sort of enterprise level stuff. You really don't need to worry about them unless you're in that space. But it's, the concepts are all the same. So the easiest way to actually explain these is to see them in action. This is real life mousetrap. Look at it on YouTube. It's awesome. It's just, fortunately, these are slightly less Rube Goldbergish than this, but it's still cool. Researching this talk was so much fun. So you start the normal way. You ask for a username and password. If the password's wrong, you reject it. Otherwise, you request, you, you look at the registered second factors that the user has on the account and you then challenge them. You ask them to, to present one, to do something. So SMS is a method you're probably familiar with. Um, there's plenty of sites out there that use it. Your bank probably uses it. And the idea, you know, in the bank case, you know, if you make a major transaction or you modify your account in some way, you know, change your address or something, you get a code sent to your phone and you pick it up and you type it in. And that confirms that you are the owner of the number. So that's pretty straightforward. All right, this is a TOTP device. I actually have some with me if you want to come and have a look. Um, TOTP is a time-based one-time password. And the way this works is when you register the device with the service, they establish a shared key. And then the device generates a six-digit code, which it derives from that key and the current time. And they also come in the form of an app for your phone. And there are tons of these. And because you know, you've got more memory on your phone, you can have multiple services. It's all cool. And so at login time, you get asked for the, the service asks you to type in the code. So you type in the current code, again, based on the shared key and the time. And then you send it to the server. The server generates one from the shared key and the current time. And if they match, then you've confirmed you have the, the device. And you can log in. And these are my favorite. Universal two-factor. Um, these are USB devices that you plug in, and they have some activation. So these are the ones from my test lab, which basically means I just buy all the ones I can find because they're fun. Um, and basically, yeah, so they'll have some kind of, some of the, most of them will have some kind of button or a touchpad or something that activates them. Others are activated by action, the, the 
actually inserting them is what activates them. Um, and these use like a bunch of modern cryptography. There's like a complete PKI stack um, inside these. Um, and they're kind of the gold standard for two-factor at the moment. And they really are standard. This is a U2F device um, designed and built by just you know, a random fellow from the internet named uh, Connor Patrick. And the hardware and the software is all open source. Um, and just last week, he started selling a small run of these on Amazon. So mine should be arriving soon, which I'm super excited about. Um, even though I won't be able to do anything with them other than put them in the box with all the other ones. But it's, like, it's cool. You can just build these things. And so at login, all you get asked to do is press the button, is activate the device in some way. The server generates a challenge, a cryptographic challenge, which it passes to the browser. The browser has a, you know, talks to, directly to the USB stack and talks to the device and says, please sign this. The device returns a signature. The, sig the signature gets sent by the browser back to the server, and it can then use you know, standard crypto to verify the signature, and that confirms you have the device. And I get ridiculously excited about U2F because most two-factor options are really awkward to use. Um, you know, they require you fiddle, press a button, type in a code, screw it up, you know, all sorts of stuff. These um, are the most secure. They use, you know, really solid, well-thought-out crypto, and they've got the best user experience because, you know, th in some cases there's no button. You just plug the thing in, and it's very rare that you get a mix of technology. Uh, uh, you get a thing that has, you know, better tech and a better user experience. So I'm like really excited about this. And in fact, I'm so excited about these that I brought some. So I have these ones. This is a Nitro Key U2F. Um, they come in a little punch card, and you punch it out, and there's a little dab of glue on the back, and you fold it back to make it thick enough for USB. Um, and you do the thing with it. And I've got 50 of these. You, know, you can use them to secure your Fastmail, your Dropbox, your GitHub, your Google account, a bunch of other accounts. Um, or you could learn them to you learn, bleh. or you could use them to learn how to add support to your app. Um, so come and see me later and get one. Um, th there is one condition on this. You have to say something publicly about what you did. I don't care if you tweet or write a blog, do a lightning talk tomorrow, and I don't care if it's simple as I have a U2F thing and I put it on my GitHub account and now I've locked myself out. <laughs> I don't care because the point of this exercise for me is I want everyone in the world to know about this. I want every site in the world to use this because I believe it's that cool. And finally, it's something that a non-technical person can understand. So come and get one later. And so why did we do this? We've now made the password useless without the second factor. So if it still leaks, the account is secure. But the second factor can't do anything by itself. So if you lose it, it doesn't matter, except that you've lost your phone. But that's your problem. <laughs> so we did it. We helped. We're helping. We're special. Our users now have a good chance of creating a good password because we're guiding them through the process. And we know how to keep it safe because we're storing it securely. And we've got two-factor available. So the password's rather less relevant than it was before. So everything's great now. It's awesome. It's all rainbows. No, it's not. Because you remember where we started? They're fundamentally terrible. The entire process is broken. And all of this talk is making the best of a bad situation. But you shouldn't despair. There are smart people working on this problem. Um, there's new technology. There's new research coming out all the time. Um, very, few, very little of it gets implemented, but people are trying stuff. And, you know, you, there's two or three InfoSec people that I mentioned might be in the audience before. You might be the one who goes on to solve this, and remember me if you do. <laughs> but for the rest of us, there's heaps we can do right now to make, make things at least acceptable for our users. And at the end of the day, that's the point. We're trying to make cool things for our users. We're trying to look after them. We're trying to give them a good experience. That's all I've got. Thank you. Uh, it's like two minutes too. I don't know if you want to do a question. I don't know if anyone has a question. So I don't know what you want to do. <laughs> Thanks. They do have some good ones. Randall is is very switched on with this. The, the best one, and you've probably seen it, is the correct horse battery staple. Um, 
Cut it. Don't use that password because it's in public. Everyone knows it. But um, explain xkcd.com. You know, it is like a wiki that explains all of the cartoons. You should go and read the article for that particular cartoon. I can find it later if you want, because it's hilarious how many like legit security people completely misunderstood that and made a bunch of recommendations that are actually very poor recommendations. So it's kind of security's hard and busted. So yeah. Uh, so the question was, if you're using a password manager, most of them can generate very long passwords. Um, is there any reason not to? And most of the reason not to is um, you have sites with interesting password policies that say, uh, you know, the password must be you know exactly eight characters or no more than sixteen or this sort of thing, and you kind of have to obey their rules. If a site will accept your insane password, use it. Because you massively increase the search space. So that would, in a way, be like canary in the coal mine if you can't still get a sense of which sites have some strange password policies and can still be. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because you have to wonder. Um, the the, the, the follow-up was that's a good um, way to see you know, if sites are doing well or not. And yeah, it is. If they've got a really terrible password policy that is actively fighting you at trying to make something secure, then maybe you should ask questions about well, what are the rest of their security practices like? Do they really know what they're doing? It's hard to know. Yes? How do you feel about the increasing tendency to use um, you know, Google or Facebook So the question was how do you feel about, how do I feel about the, the increasing, uh, I've, I've screwed up the sentence, about it being more common to use, you know, logging with Google or logging with Facebook. And I don't have a one-size-fits-all feeling for that. What you're basically doing there is saying, I'm not going to try and remember a password. Instead, I will trust someone else to take care of it for me, which means two things. If, access to, if someone gets access to that account, then they now have access to this account that you have tied to it. And also, you're trusting that company or that service to get the job done correctly. So you have to make a decision on a per service basis about if something bad happened, what would that mean for me? What would I lose? Um, I think until, in the general case for the non-technical user who, who doesn't you know, know about password manager, that sort of thing, I think it's probably not too bad because I mean the fact of it is, you know, no matter which conspiracy theory you want to go into, Facebook and Google do pretty well at security. And most people don't have don't have a need, and I'm really kind of cagey on that statement, but most people don't have that much to protect. And that's, a, I almost don't want to say that because it's so nuanced, but I think probably okay, but if you know better, you should do better. Use a password manager, use a good password manager, um, and don't use anything else, is what I'd say, if, if you need a rule of thumb. Yes. Um, <laughs> again, um, one password would be my recommendation, um, uh, particularly on OSX because it's tightly integrated there. Uh, one password, also good. Um, Dashlane is another one. Uh, they're the ones that I am familiar with. They're the ones that are integrated into your system, that are integrated into your browser. If you want an offline one, so one that you have to run a separate, separate application on your computer and it's not integrated with your browser, so you'll have to cut and paste passwords, you want KeePass. That's, that's probably the best in terms of security, but it's inconvenient because you have to manually cut and paste passwords. Again, you need to understand your own security profile and what you're protecting against. Non-answer, sorry. Unfortunately, we're... No, no, you're right. I'm sure you're all very hungry, maybe if you miss breakfast like <laughs> I am. But Rob will be around for the next two days. I'm sure he'll be happy to talk I to you. I would love to. Um, I get excited about this stuff. Over some morning tea. <laughs> so please do go ask him those questions. Tweet about them if you want. Rob is quite active on Twitter, so you can tweet at him for those. Uh, and please join me in thanking him again. Thank you.